Hey folks, and welcome to Typology, the show in which we explore the mystery of the human personality through the lens of the Enneagram. My name is Anthony Skinner. I am the producer of the show, and I want to start off by welcoming the host of our show, Ian Cron. Ian, welcome to the show. It is a pleasure to be here again with you. <laughs> as always so what's new you have some info some something new for us i i have a big announcement so okay. e most people or a lot of people know about my apricot colored golden doodle whose name is percy sweetest thing but the day before yesterday we got percy a sister <laughs> that's awesome you have a pick yeah right here oh you were ready with that yeah, it was. Can you see her? Look at that. Oh, uh, is that another doodle? It's another golden doodle, except she's chocolate and white. Oh, uh, I can't wait to see her. Beautiful. Yeah. And her name is uh, is Pip. Pip. Percy and Pip. Yeah, short for Pippa. Had nothing to do with the British royal family, but it. But we just love the name Pip. Oh, uh, how many? Because you can say things like Pip Squeak. Or you stupid pip sh <laughs> <laughs> You know what I'm saying? <laughs> did, did you just censor me? I did. <laughs> well, actually, probably a good thing. Now, I remember years ago, I was talking to a friend of mine who was a spiritual director, and they were working with an Enneagram One, right? Mm -hmm. the, I call them the improver. Most people call them the perfectionists. Mm -hmm. I call them the improvers. Uh, and uh, she was very, very Marie Kondo sort of obsessed with keeping her house clean. Mm -hmm. And like a good spiritual director, he gave her an assignment. He said, I want you to get a dog. Oh, and she was like, advice. I can't, I can't get a dog. Yeah. Right. And he said, it has to be able to shed. And she's like, I can't get a shedding dog. And he's like, you are going to get a shedding dog and you are going to learn how to live in a world of imperfection <laughs> and love it. Wow. That's great. What advice. That oh, that's great advice. Right. I love it. Yeah. Well, we have an Enneagram one on the show today. Yes, we do. And she gives us some good advice too, right? She does. Yep. Kendra Adachi, author of the upcoming new book, The Lazy Genius Way, Embrace What Matters, Ditch What Doesn't, and Get Stuff Done. Great conversation uh, with Kendra, and let's get to it. Let's get to it. Kendra Adachi, welcome to Typology. Thank you. This is really exciting. I've been listening to your show since episode one. Oh, be quiet. Oh, no. Well, that would be bad. This is a podcast. I'm not going to be quiet, but I have. <laughs> it's the truth. It's the truth. Oh, well, thank you very much. I, uh, I'm so appreciative. Now, uh, I have been asking all my type one friends, you're a type one, which signifier do they like more? the improver or the or the perfectionist of the two for sure the improver the perfectionist drives me crazy okay you, i've never had any of my type one friends say oh no stick with perfectionist really oh so no yeah. no one has said that everybody no no everybody says that. they want the improver yeah. and so that's what you are you yeah. are an improver and so um we love having improvers on the show um because we don't get as many of them as I'd like. Hmm. I've, I have noticed that, Ian. I'm like, where are all my ones at? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, there are certain types that are hard to get. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fives are hard to get. Sixes are say, hard to get. I was going to say, those fives are like, I'm sorry, you want me to what now? <laughs> like, right. they're well, not going to come on the show. And, <laughs> and, what's the, and here's what's so funny is they're often the very best guests are fives. I'm sure, yeah. Uh, they, they are so thoughtful and um, w when they speak about their experience, it's really powerful. So listen, if you are a five listening to the show right now, get it together. <laughs> answer, answer my calls. <laughs> so at the, at the front end of every show, I, I like to ask 
my guests about their, their Enneagram journey. And from what I can tell, you have a very interesting Enneagram one story, at least. Maybe not, maybe not an Enneagram journey, story, but, but a one story. So what I want to know is how did you learn about the Enneagram and, and how has it affected your life? Yeah. Well, I'm very, I'm very uh, curious as to what the, the story is, what the journey oh, is. Oh, we'll get to are. that. Okay, good. Um, no, I, I actually wasn't sure when I started learning about the Enneagram. And so I went to my Amazon um, like order history <laughs> and searched Enneagram <laughs> to find all the books. And because I remember reading the, um, the Rizzo Hudson book right. first. That was the first one I read. Well, I ordered it in July of 2014. So that is when my education began. And, um, and so I do remember, though, until I looked it up on Amazon, I do remember reading the types and immediately being like, well, well if everybody knows this about me, as, as everyone says, you know, like when you read about your type and it's so illuminating and horrible. <laughs> I remember being like, oh, so now everybody knows I'm judging them. This is really fun. <laughs> like, I that was is just, so funny. I was that running away. So, now everybody knows I'm judging them. <laughs> it was the worst, Ian. It was the worst. So, um, so I kind of stayed with that book and just the thinking I learned from that book for a couple of years until The Road Back to You came out. And then I read that. And then I read um, Beatrice Chestnut's book in 2017. So it was right. sort of like, I didn't do what I normally do when I am learning something or curious about something, which is like to swing big and do it all in one fell swoop. Um, yep. It was a really gradual thing as it should be. But I think it was because um, there was way too much for me to sift through. It was way too impactful mm -hmm. every day for me to just be like, and the next thing you can't just move on to the next thing. Right. Um, I was going to say until you get the last thing and I've never even gotten the last things. I mean, it's just, it's just yeah. a constant, kind of conversation within myself of what the Enneagram has done for me and does for me like every day. Yeah. Well, I hear you. I feel like there, there, once you start going down the, the, the wormhole, it's um, it's, it seems to be plumless. So it, the, you can, as you would say, be in a, a lifelong conversation with what you learned from the Enneagram. Right. Um, because you're talking about the mystery of your own life. And, and so you are in many ways, the least qualified to speak about it. <laughs> so, that's a devastating statement. <laughs> but I mean, but it is true because the de very definition of a mystery is something that you are in. Mm, yeah. uh, that at least someone from the outside can, can really come in and do something about. So what I want to know too, is what childhood experiences, right? led you, do you think, to adopt the improver personality style? All right. How long you got? Oh, um, I'm no, a kidding. therapist. You can go a long time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, I will say that going to therapy is one of the, the, the best things that a human can do, just mm -hmm. in general. Um, but no, I, my home life was definitely a tricky one. Um, I was an only child until I was seven, I guess. And, um, and so that's, yeah, it was just me and my parents were, they, they got married very young. It was an abusive relationship, um, on multiple levels of abuse. And, um, and I didn't really know anything was happening. Like I didn't, I think I sensed to a point that like things aren't very safe here. Um, when I was younger, but I don't, I don't have memories of, like my dad hitting my mom or my dad really doing anything to my mom. Um, but there was a general unrest. And then my sister was born and I was seven, almost seven when she was born. And shortly after she was born, my mom had a nervous breakdown and, mm. um, and left the house and went to live with some friends. And I essentially raised my sister um, uh, as a seven-year-old, which, you know, mm -hmm. is like textbook for a one in terms of like growing up fast, needing to do everything right, feeling responsible for everything. Um, and so I felt responsible because to a point I was, you know, like my father, who's not in my life anymore, but he was, yeah, like 
He wasn't there. He wasn't attuned to us. He was, he was not a good guy and was making those choices outside of the home and inside the home, but he wasn't really around. And, um, and so we had like family friends taking care of us at times. And, but I have this image of being about eight years old and my sister was a baby and she was like napping or something. And I was mopping the kitchen and listening to Sesame Street playing on the TV in the room around the corner. Mm. So that was like my engagement with Sesame Street was while I was mopping the kitchen floor. So I don't really feel like I had a childhood in the way that I wish I had or the way that I saw my friends having. And so there's been a lot of grieving in that. But um, but I think that's probably what it was, Ian, that kind of led me to this way of being. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, thank you, by the way, for sharing such a tender story yeah. that the image of you mopping the floor and listening to Sesame Street in the other room is is really heartbreaking. Yeah. I mean, I, I, like, like I can feel that in my body when you say it. You know, um, you, you did describe a sort of an iconic one story um, where a child grows up early, not unlike an eight, but has to take on responsibilities. Um, before they should, you know? Yeah. Um, and the other one we often hear is they grow up with a parent who is a one or they have incredible high demands, you know, so just the opposite, you know, parents too involved, right? Um, and uh, so, yeah, you've, you've, you've told a one tale, that, that's for sure. And, and my mom, uh, my mom is a one. <laughs> like, even okay. though, she, yeah. So it was even though she was the the victim of abuse, she was also a one. And so there was yeah. that energy. And she didn't obviously she didn't have the language for that. And there was mental illness in our family. There was a lot of things. And but I did feel the expectation a lot. Mm. Um, even even though it was unspoken for the most part. Um, like I remember, I always got great. I was valedictorian in high school. You know, like I was that was all I had was my brain. I wasn't good at anything else. And so I was like, well, I got to be the best at this. And so I remember bringing home straight A's all the time and, and never, they were, weren't really celebrated. It was just like expected, you know, like, well, of course you, of course you got A's, which there was no malice in those statements from my, from my mom or from my stepdad later on, or, you know, whatever, like they, they did, they didn't mean anything, but it did kind of like it was like confirmation bias of like, well, I really can't do anything that's good enough because mm. even the literal best is like not in- celebrated. So mm. um, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. That's a, that's a lot to unpack. And uh, I, I had a difficult childhood and I tell people all the time uh, that it's, it's not so simple as, you know, lather, rinse, repeat. Uh, it's, lather, rinse, repeat, lather, rinse, repeat, lather, rinse, repeat, you know, uh, as you begin to try and rinse out some of these um, toxic messages, beliefs, um, these energy charged uh, fears and desires that have perhaps um, become limiting, you know, uh, in ways that are, are really difficult. So what is it about being an improver and for all improvers? Okay. So I'm going to ask you to speak on behalf of all improvers that kind of breaks your heart. Mm. Oh, that's a good question. I think that, you know, whenever I hear other people talking about type ones, people that identify as ones. It really always is um, sort of, not always, that's not fair. It often is stereotypical, like you want a one to help you move. You want a one to organize your closet. You want a one right. to run your event or whatever. Right. And Marie Kondo. Oh my gosh. Right? Yes. Yeah. It just feels very um, dismissive of mm-hmm. the breadth that I feel like I, the breadth and depth that I feel like I am as a human. Yep. And, um, and I feel that way for a lot of my fellow ones that I'm in relationship with. Um, so there is sort of a broken heartedness, like on behalf of ones who just feel like we're not just like organized and together and like 
weird about dishwashers. Like, can we stop with right. being weird about, like, it's okay if you like your dishwasher to be loaded a certain way. The dishes get cleaner and you fit more in. Leave us alone. <laughs> like, right. um, and so, so I think there, there's that part. But then on behalf of ones as a one, I think that, you know, I say like, you're more than that guys, but also you don't have to be that. Like you don't have to stay in that. And I think that's where I am in my current Enneagram um, space is like, this is a, this is a construct, you know, this is the shadow. This is that language has been so helpful for me that, you know, this isn't just like, well, this is just the way I am. It's actually not, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be. And, um, and the weight that ones feel, you know, that whole, all the, you know, you, Obviously, you've had so many conversations about this, about about the inner critic, and ones are harder on themselves than they are on anyone else by like a mile. If you had any mm. idea how hard I am on myself, um, it's, I mean, it would just like crumble a lot of people. And um, on my behalf, not not like that they couldn't handle it. It's just really, it's a difficult, it's a difficult headspace to be in. Hmm. constantly. Um, but at the same time, it's not the only way we don't have to, we don't have to stay in that place that there is, there's freedom out of it when we see that it is a way that we've tried to keep ourselves safe. Hmm. Yeah. Carl Jung has this great quote. He says, uh, you, you are not what happened to you, right? You are what you choose to become. And I think that's a, a wonderful message that the Enneagram gives us, right? Mm. It, it doesn't tell us that your number doesn't tell you who you are. The, the Enneagram tells you who you could be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I think that's the, the hopeful part. It doesn't mean that you don't have to walk through the shadow and, and figure out what's in there, what, what old messages and beliefs reside there that, that need, you know, lathering, rinsing, and repeating. Um, but on the other side of that journey, you discover uh, this essential self that was lost. Yeah. Right? That was lost by no fault of your own, you know? And boy, that's a wonderful thing when you can arrive at that place and, and, and realize it. So you actually just told me you went to your, uh, therapy. Everyone should go to therapy. You love therapy. I'm assuming, are, are you in therapy now? Mm-hmm. Yep. I am. Okay. All right. So deep question time. (laughs) What are you working on? All right. Maybe you can help me with this actually. Um, Okay. Hold on. Let me just turn the meter on. (laughs) (laughs) Well played. That was nice. It's like you've gotten that joke before. Um, That was a good lead in. Okay. So no, one of the things I really struggle with just with therapy in general and with being a, being a person, let's be real is knowing how I'm doing, uh, looking back, especially, um, I've had this conversation with people so many times where they're like, so how are you? And I know they really mean it. How have things been going? How's your week been? And I am frozen as a human when I'm asked that question. I don't really know what to do Hmm. because I'm like, I don't, I can tell you how I am right now in this moment, but I don't really know. I, I've, I've left, there's so much has happened between now and last Tuesday. Like I cannot begin to tell you. And so when I go in to see my counselor, you know, and he's like, so how you been? Or what do you want to work on? Or what? I don't know how to answer that. Um, It's a really difficult thing for me to mark where I am and not lose where I am, but be able to look back enough and be engaged in something that happened a day ago or a year ago or whatever to even say, what are you working on? Um, and then I think alongside of that, that is, is a good thing is that, um, so much of my life has been, (laughs) has been paved with efforts of working on, you know, that's like, that's been the pattern is I'm always working on something. I'm always tracking something. I'm always trying right. to. And so I kind of went through a, a really long period of my life where I just stopped working on anything. I stopped tracking anything. I stopped putting limits or schedules or scaffolding around anything because I didn't know how to just be a person. 
I didn't know mm. how to not try to do that thing the best I could do it. I can't just do things and just be average. Like that's just not, and that sounds, that's like such a type one flex. I don't know how to be average. <laughs> it's not, actually, yeah. What and I it's, mean, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But it's also very four. Um, right. Oh no, that's and, good. Yes. That and, line and, is strong when I'm sad, man. It's true. Oh man. It, it sure is. On your website, you, you, you wrote something that intrigued me. It, it said, this is not a place where you'll get tips on how to do it all. The Lazy Genius Collective, which is your, your, web, your website, will, will tell you to stop doing it all. Living by a list of shoulds is exhausting and leaves zero extra time for just being a person and watching TV. And isn't that what we all really want? So I have, I, I, actually, I have finished Netflix. During COVID, I have finished the entire stream of Netflix. I have watched shows I swore I never would watch, but I have now watched them. So I have two questions for you. Uh, n- number one, that sounds so unone-like, it's ridiculous. It's true. Right? It does, yeah. So what I want to ask is, did you have to hit a wall or crash and burn in some big way at some point to arrive at that conclusion? Yes. It was called, well, the wall, hitting the wall was called having my first kid Mm -hmm. and then recovering and healing from the wall and walking away from the wall was having my second kid. Mm -hmm. Um, So... Yeah, there's there is nothing like an infant and like horm- postpartum hormones and and just life. I mean, it's really difficult. There are lots of things in life that are difficult. I'm not trying to say that having a child is the most difficult thing. That would be stupid. Um, but for me, the way that I am wired, having a baby especially is about the most difficult thing. Um, writing a book and caring for an infant are the two things that are like so against how I operate in the world because there's no end. There's no way that you can say like, well, this was good today. Um, there, it's not quantifiable. You're just mm. sitting in muck forever. Yeah. And it is exhausting. It is so yeah. exhausting to not have, it, it literally does feel like drowning because there's nothing to hold on to. There's nothing that says you did a good job today or you hit that mark today, or you did this perfectly today. That's just, that doesn't exist. And, right. um, and so when I had, when I had my son, he's 10 now. Um, when I had my son, it was like, I don't, I don't know how to be a person. Like I just felt, um, untethered. I felt like I didn't recognize myself. My inner critic was screaming because if there's anything that's going to, you know, show you that you're doing it wrong. Oh yeah. Because there's so many options, you know, when you're raising a baby, everybody's got an opinion. Like I was tired. It's just, it's just, it's a madhouse. It's like awful. Um, right. But then when my son, my son, my second son was born two years later, there was a little bit more like I had lived in that muck for long enough that I knew it wasn't going to kill me. You know, right. it's like, okay, I can do this. And not right. like a bootstraps way. Just like, I didn't die. Like I'm still here. Um, and I wasn't as mm, grippy and clingy hmm. um, to being the right kind of mother with my son. He was born in, all right, let's see if this lines up. I'm curious about my Enneagram book purchase timeline and my children having timeline. So my first son was born in 20, 2009. That's not a thing. That's not how people say that. Um, in 2009. And then my second son was born the end of 2011. And I got pregnant with a surprise child in 2015. So actually it's like in the middle. And so I was like sort of in the Enneagram journey when I had my daughter. Um, and when she was born is when things really started to kind of swing the way of, oh, this is sad. We're not living this way anymore. I don't want to live mm-hmm. this way anymore. It is, there's so much goodness. That seven line was like waving at me, throwing confetti, like let's party. This is too hard. Um, you don't have to live this way. So I think having kids is, that was the progression of sort of coming to this place where a lot of people say to me, you don't sound like a one. What is this way? This way, the lazy genius way. (laughs) 
let's just throw my book title, right? <laughs> no, but this way of living, which is the, the, the tagline of my business is, and my, not just my business, but like truly what I feel genuinely called to, not in a stupid way, but like genuinely called to encouraging women, especially to be a genius about the things that matter. It's okay to care about things that matter to you, but be lazy about the things that don't, which means you have to name what matters Mm. and what doesn't matter. Um, There's just too much pressure to do all the things. That's sort of a, a tired argument at this point of like, well, we know we can't do it all. I feel like culture has sort of transitioned to a place where at least for the most part, women are like, yeah, I can't do it all. But then what they do is they think that the only option is to give up and not care about anything. Is and to not put effort into anything that matters to them, um, or they're embarrassed to care. You know, the number it's sort of like this um, messy hair don't care vibe, which it's cool if you like messy hair and you don't care, that's wonderful. That's not a knock on messy hair or not caring about it, but I feel like that has become a crutch for people who care deeply, mm-hmm. women especially who are moms who really they it's almost like they feel shame for caring about something and putting time and effort into something because someone's going to be like, well, you're trying too hard. Um, that, that, that there's, there's a different way. There's a middle way. It's not try hard or give up. It's just right. care about what you care about and let everybody care about what they care about. And let's just live lives and hold hands and calm down. You know, uh, it's so funny. I was walking through an airport one day and uh, I was walking by Hudson News. And so I just happened to see what the best sellers were. And one of them was this bright orange neon cover, which obviously caught my eye, right? It was just screaming off the shelf. And I went over and the name of the book, I can't give you the whole title. It, it, it was called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a, an yes. F, right? Yes. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's a clever title. It's an interesting cover design. I'm actually going to buy this book. Now, I do not normally buy... Self-help isn't the right word, but th- those that no, style I of yeah, yeah. I, I don't I don't normally buy those. Uh, and I read it on the airplane, and to my surprise, I absolutely loved it. <laughs> and in part because he had seven or eight great points, and if you have that many great points in a book, I think that's a pretty big win. And but one of them, one of the premises of the book is that if you don't decide in life what you're going to give an f about you will give an F about everything. Right. Hmm. Then, and so, Or then after that, nothing. When you realize you right. can't give an F about right. everything, then yes. you're like, well, F it. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> like, yeah. There's not and a so, middle ground. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I just think, I thought to myself, you know, he's right. If you, if you pick the three or four things that you really care about, then when the woman at CVS who cuts in line, uh, you know, or someone dents your car you just don't take it it's like i'm not going to care about that this much you know it's like i know what i'm going to care about and what i'm not going to care about in life mm-hmm. and so i think that's just wonderful perennial wisdom and something else you said really gripped me and it because it, this was a, a, an experience for my wife Anne when we had children uh ann has a perfectionist mother now she's a nine but she carries that intergenerational voice Mm. Um, that sort of comes down, is passed down. And when she uh, read about this idea, and I can't remember the psychologist, I should, um, Winnicott maybe, uh, that, you know, all you had to be was a good enough mother. That, that, and that's the phrase he uses, the good enough mother. Mm-hmm. Like, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to get everything right. You, you just have to be good enough. And when my wife read that, I think you could feel all the oxygen come back into her life. <laughs> yeah. You know, because it was it's kind of a revelation. Like, I don't have to get this perfectly. Like, wow. You know, so you're known as the lazy genius. I am indeed. And in fact, one of your mantras is be a genius about the things that matter and lazy about the things that don't. Right. Yep. And when I read that, I think, okay, I'm going to interview an, uh, today a, a, a type one, an improver. And I thought, lazy? <laughs> How on earth did an Enneagram one, a type <laughs> typically can't stop working to perfect the world and relax, come to, 
you know, to embrace that way of being in the world. And I think you've answered it in part, but I'm, I'll ask it again. How on earth does a type one embrace laziness? Yeah. Well, to be completely frank, it is, it's not easy. Right. You know, it's not like a, it's not a natural thing. Right. Um, I think it is a muscle that gets stronger like anything, mm. you know, the more that you practice um, thinking things that are no longer harmful, you know, releasing thoughts that are harmful, uh, telling yourself at the end of the day, like, see, that was, that was fine. You can do that, you know? Um, but I, I have, I've added a lot of practices into my life that help me remember that it's okay to be lazy about certain things. Um, you know, I, I meditate and, um, I really love breath prayers. Um, and I think the reason both of those things help is because they are so of the moment and it's hard for me to evaluate evaluate them mm. because they're over so quickly <laughs> mm, <laughs> and they right. don't have anything to show, you know, there's nothing yeah. to show for them at the end. Um, mm. But I will say, I think that, I think that the, the reason that, that lazy is part of this other than let's be real, you guys, lazy genius is a great name, right? Come on. Yeah. I'm credit for this. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, no, other than the fact that it, it's, it's a good name and makes people intrigued. Like, what is that? Sure. Um, yeah. There is such room for, being lazy about things, because if you're not, it's like you said, you were saying before, it's like, we put so, we just put so much pressure on ourselves and then therefore on other people to be able to check every box and then no boxes get checked and we're all tired. I just became really um, tired on behalf of my friends and the women that I would interact with on the internet. Cause I've been writing on the internet for 10 years, but is that how long, maybe longer than that, 10 or 11. And, um, but it's just been, the lazy genius has just been around for about four. And so I've been around women online and have heard from them for a long time and just became so like at first burdened by how tired everyone was at trying and trying and trying and trying and trying. And and realizing that they're, but even the one, but even the ones who gave up were still tired. That yeah. was what, that's what kind of like got me to start thinking about this is that even the ones who gave up were tired because pretending like you don't care is just as exhausting as caring about too much. Mm -hmm. They're both exhausting. And so the question uh, or the answer is not just be lazy or just be a genius. It's you have to make those two things be friends or you're going to not enjoy your life. You're going to resent your kids. You're going to look right. beyond your own experiences. You're going to be so, you're going to have, you're going to track how many glasses of water you drink when like, you're probably fine. Like just drink water when you're thirsty and then like, it's going to be okay. You know, like just putting so much um, structure around trying to create an, an optimal life, an optimized life that you're making every single minute count. And you can make every single minute count by being like, I don't care about the minutes, but it's still exhausting. Or you can make every single minute count by doing and doing and doing. And so um, I think that my own experience of, of the freedom of living that way through learning about the Enneagram, through learning about the fact that it is, that personality is a construct and I don't have to be, I don't have to be um, like chained to that anymore. Therapy, children, loving friends, you know, all the things that you sort of have. But as I started to live that and experience the not just freedom and like a like a buzz like christianese way but like legitimate like oh this doesn't feel heavy anymore right like i feel like myself now i finally feel like myself i just my passion for that and for the women that i want to sort of like feel free from this is just way too big for me to keep it to yeah. myself right that's just my personality and so that's why i created the lazy genius collective so, wow. so Anthony, I can tell. Yeah, I can tell every yeah. time when you have a question. I can, there is that something was, that in your face. That was amazing. That was amazing right there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, you can time it. Oh, I got a couple of them. One is, uh, just for our Enneagram ones out there, what does a breath prayer look like that helps you break the cycle during the day? When you're in the middle of it, 
you know, the, and the, the, the spin and you need to break out of that trap. What does a breath prayer look like? Yeah. Mine right now that has been my breath prayer for a long time and probably will be for a long time is not despite because, and let me explain that. So for a long time, I thought that, um, my failures, people loved me despite my failures, despite that I came up short, despite the fact that I did not see them, um, when they needed to be seen. And, but what that does is that still puts a responsibility on me. I still feel like, well, you still could have been enough, you know, like your deficiency, um, is, you know, to, it, it's a good thing. Your deficiency does, didn't cause more harm than it could have. It's sort of what that mindset kind of created in me for a long time of like, well, people like me, despite the fact that I, whatever. And when I kind of transitioned into like, oh no, you're loved because you're flawed. You're loved because you missed a friend and then, but you guys still love each other and you still sought each other out and you mended and moved on. You do what people in relationship do, mm. you know, like, um, that turn was, was literally life-changing for me. Mm. Um, and so that is my, that's constant. It's on my phone screen. Every time I turn on my phone, I see not despite because, um, and so that, that constant reminder of the truth of who I am to my, in relationship with myself, in relationship to my people, um, has been remarkably freeing now not all at once necessarily you know like it's um it's like a baby bird learning to fly you know like you have your wings like you can you can you have sort of the tools and the mechanism to fly but you haven't quite had your wings for long enough to feel confident enough to get off the ground yeah. and so it's but so the more that i say that to myself the more that i pray that um the the stronger i feel to yeah. be myself and rise like an like a phoenix from the ashes or whatever. How far are we going to take this analogy, you guys? <laughs> well, Anthony, you had a second question. Is that yeah? So, um, as an improver, uh, what things do you still find that you can't approach without being perfectionistic? <sighs> That's a really good question, Anthony. I think friendships, mm. I think I am a, um, hold on. I'm just, the words just left me like all the, the subtypes. I'm a, yeah. I'm a sexual, I'm a sexual one. Mm -hmm. So the one, the one-to-one -one is incredibly, incredibly important. I learned, I learned that when, um, I would have birthday parties for myself. Cause my, you guys, this is really sad. My birthday is two days after Christmas. And so I just didn't have birthday parties because everyone's like at grandma's, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I kind of have to throw myself birthday parties, even as an adult, it's fine. It's I'm, I've accepted it. It's good. But um, a few years ago, I invited like a bunch of my girlfriends over just to like have a thing. And it was, and we, t I mean, I've talked to them, but it was like so awkward and awful because I didn't, I couldn't manage the one-to-one -one connection. Like the, the strings, my heart was like tied to all of their hearts. There were so many strings and it was like, this is way too much. I can't, I can't do this. I can't do, I can't do group time. <laughs> like I'm not a group time person. And so, um, so all that to say, I think that I'm still learning how to be a friend. I'm still learning how to, what it's like to mess up, to say the wrong thing. Um, and I think in some ways the Enneagram has been incre incredibly helpful in my relationships, but also has, it's almost like it's given me too much information mm. because yeah. I, can, I can know the type. I can know my friends, what my friend identifies as, and I can say, well, they don't want to feel this way. So even though me, I would say this, I'm not going to say this because it might not be what they need to hear. It's still leading with me. And then, and then we're not connecting because I'm not being fully myself um, because I am assuming a certain way that they are. So I think that's definitely the place it is. I, I feel like I, I rehearse things more than I would like when it comes to friendships. I rethink things. When, the number of times that I've started a conversation with a friend where I'm like, hey, listen, I just want to make sure we're okay because A, B, and C. Because I said this, I did this, are we okay? are we okay? I'm always like checking in. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would like to be more grounded in my place in my relationships and my friendships. Um, and not feel like I have to be the perfect friend so they don't leave, 
you know, lots of abandonment issues. Um, Cause if I mess up, aren't they going to leave? I've said that to my friends, like, but aren't you going to leave? And they're like, no, Kendra, we're not leaving. Like calm down. So uh, that's definitely the, the place that feels the raw, the most raw with that. I think. Mm. Yeah. You have this other quote uh, in the, in the lazy, the lazy genius way. Uh, embrace what matters, ditch what doesn't, and get stuff done. Um, you say this, be kind to yourself. You're worth, worthy of kindness. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, I want to revisit the inner critic, even though you've already uh, mentioned it. Um, we know that the inner critic is very unkind, right? And you've said so, right? But how have you made peace with the inner critic? Because it doesn't go away, right? No. I mean, it, 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 it remains there. It's not like suddenly, oh, I'm good with me, you know? So tell me what, how have you, or what do you do when the inner critic activates in the worst of ways? How, yeah. how do you be kind to yourself? That's a great question. Um, so this is one of the most profound things that happened to me in therapy. And it was a few years ago where, um, and I'm sure there's like an official name for it. I just don't know what it is. Um, but basically it was like using your imagination. Um, and my, my counselor led me through a practice of, of remembering a specific event in my childhood and, um, and sort of like inviting different, inviting her inviting nine-year-old me to the table, um, like walking her to the table. I did that with um, like different versions of myself that feel like they're always speaking. So I feel like I almost have an inner critic at several ages, you know, the, the oldest, I have like the innocent four-year-old who doesn't really say anything. And then the nine-year-old is very loud. The nine-year-old is very loud, which makes sense because that's when my like become an adult and not be a kid anymore was, you know, pretty heightened. Um, but I have like all of these versions of me from different, different ages. And the practice that my counselor took me through was just to basically like have a conversation with all of them and mm. tell them that they were okay. You know, just right. tell them that invite them into the conversation and be like, I appreciate I appreciate what you're trying to tell me right now. I know you're worried. I know you're worried that by saying that thing that this friend is going to leave because that's what was you were afraid of when you were nine and you thought if you messed up, your dad was going to leave. Well, he did leave, but he didn't leave because of me, you know, right. selling, telling my nine-year-old that he didn't leave because of you. Um, I understand your, your concern. I understand your worry. I understand that you want to be in charge here because you think you know how the story ends. But I just want to tell you that you, you don't know. And the story ends way better than you think it does. And come sit with us. And, you, you know, it's, there's just this generosity of spirit that my that counseling has done for me. And then just sort of understanding um, the voices in my head and, and kind of how all of those things work together through the language of the Enneagram. Like there's just a, there's a compassion for the inner critic. Yeah. Um, for at, at those different ages, even, you know, just a compassion of like, I know you're trying to help me. It makes sense that you would feel this way right now that you're screaming at me. You have screwed up. Do you know what you've done to us? You know? Um, but to just have like the compassion for her to say, but we're, thank you, but mm. we're okay. We're okay. You know? Um, I tried to silence it for too long and they just get louder. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's so beautifully put, and I, I think something that Enneagram Ones will will really benefit from. I, you know, you mentioned at the top of the interview things that break your heart about you as an improver and others as improvers. And, and one of the ones that always gets me is probably more than any other number, ones tell me they don't want to be their number. <laughs> uh, and and it, it saddens me because you know, every number is equally beautiful, equally needed, mm -hmm. uh, equally esteemed. Um, and, you know, uh, it's, I think part, and it's a surprise to them when they find out that other people don't have the inner critic. 
for real. I was like, wait, you, I'm sorry. Everyone right. else is living a cushy mental life here where there's not oh, some. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, it's I like, was I, really upset about that. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. No, no. I actually even have an inner praiser, which is not a good thing <laughs> um, because it, 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 is, it is as delusional as your inner critic. Um, <laughs> but I, so I'm always reminding ones to do what you're saying, which is to be kind to yourself, you know. Uh, you you are worthy of love and relationship, and you don't have to. John Steinbeck has this great quote. He says, "And now that you don't have to be perfect, you can be good." Mm. And yeah. I I've always sort of thought of that as a beautiful word for ones. You know, um, you can be good, and good is good enough in many yeah. instances. Okay, so you have this new book. Uh, the, the lazy genius way, embrace what matters, ditch what doesn't and get stuff done. It drops in August. Is that right? That's right. August 11th. And so, so people can go online right now and pre-order that book. And so, and how do people learn more about what you're doing? Like, like there's the lazy genius podcast. They can go and subscribe to that, but, but tell us the other ways that people can hear about what you're doing. Yeah. Well, I, I, I say a lot of words that are hopefully helpful. That was a weird sentence. I was about to be like, I say helpful words on my podcast. Um, I do hope they're helpful. No, I talk on the podcast and then um, I, I, by the write... way, we just, by the way, we just saw the inner critic in action. Did you see that? <laughs> you did. There it was. Good job. She Kendra. actually, she actually spoke out loud what the voice was saying in her head. It's true. It's true. It's, awesome. it's just, it's just what happens sometimes. But I put you know the what? adverb in the, I put the adverb in the wrong I did. place. I put it it should have been place. before the now. We will not chastise her. She was doing her best. She's That's afraid. Right. She's trying. That's basically, right. what she's doing is she's trying to save you and edit, is what she's doing. <laughs> um, okay, no, I I'm on Instagram at the Lazy Genius. I'm on there a lot, uh, talking stories mostly because um, I like to I like to show people from an emotional perspective how to make chicken, but also how you like can't systemize everything. So um, I just, yeah, I love to communicate on Instagram and then at the um, lazygeniuscollective.com. Um, there's a place where you can join my newsletter and I, I write pretty vulnerable things one, uh, once a month. Um, but I will say the book is, the book is the, the book is like the toolkit that I think that every well, for sure, any grim one. But I think that that everybody who struggles with this try really hard or just give up sort of mentality um, needs to read. Because one of the things that was frustrating to me about um, that quote unquote self-help category that you're like, is that really what it is? I don't know. Um, I sort of call the lazy genius way the self-help book for people who are tired of reading self-help books. Because um, it seems like the expectation is that we copy the author's way. This is not Kendra Adachi's way. This is the lazy genius way. And there are principles in the book for you to kind of create a system or um, like a deep breath around anything. And one of those principles is to be kind to yourself. So um, I do feel like now some of them are like super tangible as well. This isn't just like a, you know, a kumbaya book, like it will help you get stuff done. Um, but there is, there needs to be both. There needs to be right. both. Right. And, um, and I just feel really passionate about being a messenger for both um, in this book. And so if, if anything I've said makes you go like, oh, I like, I like the way she thinks the book is your best bet for sure. Great. Great. Well, I want to encourage everybody to Go on Amazon, pre-order The Lazy Genius Way, embrace what matters, ditch what doesn't, and get stuff done. It'll be in your mailbox come August. And um, Kendra, thanks for being on the show with us. This has been so great. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, what a fun time. And to uh, all my Typology listeners, we love you. We're grateful for you. And we want you to remember the words of the great Oscar Wilde, be yourself. Everybody else is already taken. Until next time.